telling me about like, yeah, last night we had to go to the emergency room because I got a novelty condom and uh, my girl wanted me to like, it was like a troll doll with like the crazy hair on the end of a condom. And he like, his girl wanted him to use it and like didn't work out. <laughs> and I won't tell his graphic version of the story, but like, yeah, just, I wonder what that guy's doing now. Like if he ever got help or, and I remember like trying to talk to him and asking him if he wanted help. And he's just like, nah, man, I just want to smoke crack. Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000s punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. Before we start, if this podcast was in your top five for the Spotify year in review thing, send me a screenshot and I will post it on my Instagram and I will tag you. Harvesting the Crust was an inline skate movie from the mid-90s that was shot out in the Midwest. It included skaters Steve Thomas, Chris Edwards, Shane Nelson, John Schmidt, John Robinson, and a bunch of other people. The reason I'm doing this interview is because this was a big part of my life when I was growing up because my buddy Rob Heiner got this skate comp because we were both into the whole inline aggressive skating back in the day. And this led us to finding a bunch of bands, which if you've heard the last episode with 10 Foot Pole, I mentioned this movie, which made me go down the rabbit hole and find Shane and be like, hey, dude, you want to talk about this error? And he was like, definitely. This skate comp was just like anything else. It was just a mix of bands that we didn't know of, which led us to go find out who they were. And also guys that we idolized back in the day because they were doing tricks that we wanted to do. So we would just look up to this and just be like, how do they do this? And just watch it over and over again to think like one day we'll be this cool. And this led us down a path to see it like some video comps from this era, like Mad Beef, Hoax 2, and all the Video Groove movies. This video is like such a defining part of my life. So I'm really excited that I got to get Shane uh, to talk about it. So I reached out. He said, yeah, like I said, and I got him on the Skype. And this is what we talk about. 10 foot pole. How people found other skate videos, being a stunt double in Mighty Ducks, Chris Edwards, having seizures, helping to make Like a Lion the true story of legendary skier Tanner Hall, directing an Against Me video, John Cheese, did they get licensing for the songs in Harvesting the Crust, the skateboard dude from the video, Dave Payne from Video Groove, Brian Smith, Scribe, Sled Dogs, shooting a No Effects video, and a ton more. Make sure you go check out his company, OmniFusion. I got a link to it in the show notes. The write-up on the website says, OmniFusion was founded in 2002 so we could hang out with our friends making amazing visuals for cool companies. They've collaborated with over 250 artists, designers, and filmmakers on over 235 projects. Their clients range from Fortune 500 companies and famous athletes and musicians to ad agencies, nonprofits, and startups. And one time, they even got a check from comedic genius Jim Carrey. I wish I would have known that. I would have asked what the fuck that was about lastly i have a patreon and uh, i'm starting to put all the episodes that are not on the podcast apps because like i've said many times that they only keep the first or the recent 100 anything before that you can't find on an app from what i'm told or what i've seen so i'm putting these in my patreon for a different tier it's a three dollar a month tier you can go back and listen to a lot of stuff and it's just like all in one spot and the cool thing is that when you get the app the patreon app It'll play the episodes like a, a, a like a podcast player or whatever, which is one of the reasons I'm doing it. So go check it out, uh, patreon.com slash this was the scene if you want to uh, subscribe. I'm still uploading it, so I'm like all the way back to episode up to 29 so far. And I apologize to anyone who has my Patreon right now because you probably got a lot of emails telling you that I was uploading. So if you want to stop that, you got to go in your preferences and just turn off the email notifications. So yeah, if you want to go support that, that'd be awesome. That's all I gotta say, so feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who would love some punk rock nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. So I reached out to Arlo like two or so years ago to try to interview him because me and my buddies grew up when we got into the skate or to the um, punk scene, we started skating, but we were like doing rollerblading like you guys. Yeah. And we watched like Mad Beef, which led to Hoax 2, which led to Harvesting the Crust, which I really want to talk about. And then I, I was, I interviewed Dennis from 10 Foot Pole last week. I was just like, did you guys know that you're in this video comp from back in the day called Harvesting the Crust? He goes, no. I go, that's how we found your band. So I thought this was, and then I'm researching it. And then I found this blog that you did and that led to me finding you on Instagram. So, and here we are. <laughs> yeah. Now we're going to get sued by 10 foot pole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, um, so the whole premise of the podcast is I go back and talk about, usually it's bands, um, producers, roadies, 
managers and shit like that who like usually how they got involved in the scene. This one's really important to me because this was such a pivotal part of me getting into the scene and this this film. I mean, I've been rewatching some of it and just bringing back all these memories. And I thought this interview would just be so fucking awesome. And um, but yeah, but you send me this list of stuff that's pretty awesome. So I'm gonna try to guide this as much as possible as usual. But just before we start in, did you know that there is a? I know I'm kind of over the place. I'll eventually hone it in. But did you know they just did a hoax two reunion on YouTube? I saw that. You know, I still am friends with some of those guys. Uh, like I did a podcast a while back with Arlo, Chris Edwards, where they were trying to find or hunt down the enigmatic Steve Thomas. <laughs> and like, yeah, it was like uh, Machio and me ended up on it because Steve's like hard to find. So but it was really fun because we were just talking about the good old days. And um, Brian Smith is like a famous photographer now. And uh I still am friends with uh, B. Harden on Facebook and, wow. and Michael Pollock. And these. it's just it's like a movie when you think back in your head about like how lucky we got to be in that era. Did you guys like at that time, did you see, I don't know, just a lot of eyes on you? Because I know it was kind of hard back then because there wasn't social media and there was just your friends. There was you get a CD, you see the thank you list, you buy the band. And that's how people found out about bands. 100 percent. And then with the same thing with like the video, actually, how did it work with the skate videos? Did you guys thank each other on the back? Like how did one lead to the other? Okay. So my entry to that whole scene was skateboarding in like second grade from like, we were like kind of, you know, poor. So I had the Veriflex board and I didn't realize like there was this whole culture on top of each of these scenes, but, but rollerblading didn't exist. It was like, skating and like some guy in the parks like nice pink veriflex you know expletive like derogatory term that would be used at the time for like you know you didn't realize there was this whole like uh scene which i think you you know is huge in like the stuff on your podcast but but at the time i just was having fun skateboarding and then i like realized oh you have to buy certain kind of gear to do the kind of tricks part of that was just watching these amazing skate videos like bones brigade and you know, you would get exposed to the the punk music. Um, I remember watching like Snowboarders in Exile, and getting into like SST records, and like, you know, my mom was like pretty Christian and like was like, "What is this music?" And um, I remember like trying to explain to her that like Striper was a Christian metal band, so I could listen to it, or One Bad <laughs> like <laughs> thrash punk or whatever but it was like kind of this thing we had to hide anyway but yeah watching those videos not i wasn't a good skateboarder but i could do like no slides on a handrail and you know land one out of every like 50 and we would just sit around and record on our someone someone's parents would have a a camcorder then go home and watch videos and you just the music was like a part of that lifestyle i got into punk early but didn't really know anything about it. And my older brother was much older and he was into like the cars and like Led Zeppelin and sort of classic rock. I think it's really cool that that's how you had Big Brother magazine. The joke being like, you know, they were your big brother. They were where you found out about cool punk and stuff like that. And that was the the sound for that era, 1980 through probably 90 seven or something does that sound right to you yeah actually it's funny you said big brother because daily bread was the magazine that was the rollerblading magazine and i have a web comic that i've done for like almost six years and i was trying to think of a name six months into it and i remember daily bread because my friend used to get it all the time and then i just kind of made a play on it where it was like daily but b-r-e-d almost like you have it every day it's like but I remember that, and so that's why I like came with that name. But my buddy would get that all the time. So yeah, that was like we were surrounded with. We'd go to like Pelican Skate Shop in Jersey, and they'd have Daily Bread there. We're like, oh my god, it's the latest issue. Yeah, I mean that was the that was the the way you found out about things. And I think I got lucky because in like 1992 or 90 early 93, Chris Edwards came to Minnesota. And we were we tried out for the Mighty Ducks for like rollerblading. And, you know, I grew up playing hockey. I mean, you're in Minnesota. I, and I was on a ski team and I was like really young. But these these dudes were like brought me in. And then in the summer, our coach was like, you got to cross train on rollerblades. So we started going off ramps and doing all this stuff. And there really wasn't a scene like there was rollerblade where you would see like people in spandex like going through cones or jumping off like a 
two stair or something. And yeah. we were skateboarders. So we, we just started doing kind of like tricks. And I'm pretty sure it was like our coaches were Martin and Lewis Sunquist, and they were like big time, you know, Olympian skiers. And they were like, you should try grinding on the this uh, like bike rack or something. And we did it. It was me, Nate Strandberg, and uh, John Schmidt. John went on to be big time pro for Rollerblade, and we were all sponsored by Rollerblade. But I think he was on Team Rollerblade for a while, but he got like really good really fast. I just remember Chris Edwards showed up at this little uh, this little rink in Hopkins, Minnesota. We were doing handrails, and he like freaked out and like started calling people. And Rollerblade was down the street in in Hopkins. The next thing I knew, we like were sponsored and had like free skates. Holy shit! He was like a, a big air like vert guy. Oh yeah, he was like you know our hero because he could do he he had done handrails I believe like small ones in the video like ninety two or early early ninety three. But if you go watch Dare to Air or some of those movies, you know they're not. I think he does like one handrail in that movie, and it was like mind blowing. But we had seen you know his section and and we knew other people were doing it it was like all you know new york or maybe like la you know kind of a thing my recollection which i think it's like starting to get foggy enough where i conflate two stories or like you know you some of this probably turn out to be inaccurate but i'm just kind of trying to speak from my recollection is like i got into the movie mighty ducks as a stunt double so Chris Edwards and myself were Charlie's stunt double from the movie Mighty Ducks. Um, <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, it was like, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of depressing that I peaked in like sixth grade or seventh grade or whatever. But, <laughs> but I mean, that was amazing. And just becoming friends with him. And he was so, such a great human. Like, I remember like, you know, I didn't have a, a lot of money, but like, he's like, you got to come wakeboarding. So we went out to his like palatial hobby farm and he just like bought wakeboards. So everyone would have the right size because I was like tiny. And yeah, he just was like a really great human, you know? Wasn't he like really, he was like religious too, right? Super religious at that time, but not in a weird way. He was in a way like, you know, he walked the talk. Like, you know, he was just a nice human. And um, I remember him just like making it so everyone could hang out and have like a place to do stuff. And, you know, he wasn't always in town, but when he was in town, he would, you know, hit us up and we'd like go roller. I have a shot of him just like bleeding everywhere where he crashed really hard. And it's like, I want to say it's like, if he if you if these people weren't all there, they're all on the film I shot. But I shot like super eight film of him trying this gnarly stunt and just bleeding everywhere. And like Arlo and Brooke Howard Smith and uh, Steve Thomas, of course, and like all the scribe guys are in this video. When I think back, it's sort of like my little brother or something in these videos. The fact that we got to like tour the world and just travel in that era, you got to realize it was more like, hey, jump over this car and do a flip or like something stupid. And then like two years later, it was like really cool. We were on magazines like Daily Bread and all these videos. Two or three years later, it was like not cool again because of Big Brother. What time, what time period was this? So this would have been 93, 92, 93. This is me again, might be a year off. Well, yeah, this is loosely my recollection is like 93, 94 is when we really started doing like kinked handrails. And I want to say like we started filming for Harvesting the Crust. The 95, I believe, was Hoax 2. So I was like, you know, traveling, doing tours. And I won, Um, I want to say I won like Scraps Amateur Championship or something in Chicago. My music soundtrack was Green Day going to Pasolacqua. <laughs> like, and like, uh, no doubt. Gwen Stefani and like Brad Noel. Then I went to Am Jam and I won that in Ohio. And then I like turned pro, which meant like nothing really, except for that you are on a pro team. Right after that, that summer, I was in uh, Colorado doing NIS and ASA. Do you remember those tours? Sounds kind of familiar. Yeah, they were like the pro tours, like the PGA of rollerblading. And we drove out there. It must have been 95 because I'm pretty sure we were listening to Weezer. Anyway, I ended up having a seizure. And like pissing myself and like front everyone, like bleeding everywhere. And the guy thought I was on drugs. He's like, what drugs are you on? And I, you know, I was like passed out in the back of an ambulance. I just remember like thinking it was weird. I had heat stroke or something. Then I went to Chicago the next weekend or a few weekends later. And I had another seizure again, like on TV. <laughs> like, oh, wow. That was like the end of my rollerblading career. Because every time I would rollerblade or skateboard or snowboard or do anything, I just have a seizure, which isn't can be life-threatening and like people literally in that era like there was no social media so like the rumor got back like oh yeah he died dude i was i was gonna (laughs) say that so okay so i want to 
stop here for a second because I do want to go back and break down all the other stuff we were talking about. But yeah, I remember – so it was a year or so after Harvesting the Crust. I think me and my buddies only skated for like a year or two, and then we just were like, let's just be in a punk band and play and do that shit. But I remember my buddy Rob, he – he heard he goes i heard a rumor that shane got cancer and he died yeah and so when i found you the other day i was like oh my god he's he's fucking alive i thought you were dead this entire time yeah everyone thinks i'm dead which is amazing and also kind of cool have people like at the mall they like were like are you you look like this dude i used to know like who's in you know like and i tell them it's me and they'd be like no i thought you died or they my wife now my girlfriend it's like, <laughs> we'd just be somewhere and someone would like come up and ask for an autograph or something and she thought that was so weird <laughs> so like just recently i was having this party at my house with, like all these like old people it feels like to me now mid 40s and i was talking to uh, a friend who's and he was just like talking to someone who in the driveway, they were like, oh, yeah, someone just came up to me. He's like, how do you know this guy? Like, he was like my favorite. And and he was like, I don't know you as like the famous rollerblader. I know you as like the guy who makes shitty music videos. And like, for, <laughs> like and, and, but it was so fascinating to see him see me like everyone else sees him because he's um been on, you know, Warp Tour and all these band, TV shows and all this stuff. Yeah, like that. I don't really talk about it that much for some reason I, I i think it's cause it was like super heartbreaking to be so in love with something and like the music the culture the lifestyle and then it's like ripped away from you in one week yeah that must have been well i mean you know and i do want to go back but like since then just so people don't know you sent me a list of music videos you've done and it was no effects against me motion city soundtrack minus the bear new, new pornographers and so on like even bon jovi i mean if that didn't happen it's kind of hard to say but like do you think if that didn't happen you would have gone on to do this career you've, you're doing yeah i mean for people who don't know like my background was i was like really good at sports when i was a little kid and everyone's like oh you're gonna be like this next soccer star or something and i would do like meet these European coaches who like hated it. They'd be like, you're American. You can't know soccer. And it was just like, not fun. Like go run up this hill. And then all of a sudden I was like traveling the world, meeting like girls, like doing, getting paid to like do this weird thing. So I quit like soccer and everything. And it was like a big, I remember it was like a big, I separated my shoulder and it was like a big argument. Cause they're like, you gotta like go hang out on the sideline with your team. And I was like, no, I don't. I can, I'm just going to go to skate camp and like get paid to like do whatever I want. <laughs> it was, you know, we were listening to like punk music and my mom was super amazing. And she was like, in some ways, like overprotective but in other ways. She, my friends were all really nice. So she just let me go with them. And so we would ski in the winter and then we would rollerblade in the summer. And so basically that ended up turning into a thing where I, you know, knew all these people. But when I got seizures, I was able to start a rollerblading company and that was United Urethane from 1997 to 2001-ish. And then after that, like, I was, like, kind of ended unceremoniously. I could tell longer versions of these stories, but just to give people a background. But, yeah, then I was like, what did I like about that? I like making movies. So we had made this movie with this guy Spencer Franks from Australia with, like, all these rollerbladers like Dion Antony, John Julio. He was, like, the first guy that I saw do a Unity grind. 100%. Like, legend still, like, in the game and just – like living out the dream and making rollerblading awesome. Um, yeah. I recently talked to Dion and his recollection of that time was a little different. Like he, you know, we were trying so hard to make something cool and, it, and it, when it doesn't work out, you just feel embarrassed in a weird way. I kind of got like hustled out of it. I had a non-compete and some other things that I couldn't like do. And these guys, oh, these are like 50 year old businessmen that <laughs> hold me all this money. And he's like, I'm teaching you a valuable business lesson. I'm not going to pay you because like there's some line in the contract. It was just ridiculous. I, I realized like I was kind of like making movies and I had made a bunch of action sports films after that because they saw that I made like that one movie. And so I ended up hooking up with like Eric Iberg. He's kind of a skiing legend, Tanner Hall. And then I ended up making, I think like 12 action sports films. One with Pat Milbury, the snowboarder artist, um, and my roommate at the time, Leif. A couple of rollerblading ones, you know, maybe 10 ski movies with like Johnny DeCesare, Poor Boys Productions. And then Tanner and I just ended up making a bunch by ourselves. So we made a Like a Lion for Red Bull in 2011. And that was like a big hit. It was just all about his life. I remember like we sent them, we had like Final Cut, because this was before Red Bull Media House. They were like, this movie is like tells too much. And like he was in there talking about how weed's going to get legalized and like all the stuff with like his girlfriends. That we didn't like name names or anything. 
and then you know he's talking about doing drugs and and different stuff in the movie and um but what's so great about tanner is he's just a real dude and he's like so polarizing if you don't show that it's a propaganda film like why not tell the real story about an amazing human who has all of the same weaknesses we all do so we did that and i remember like the red bull dude was like not he was like this is like too much but anyway we ended up winning a bunch of awards that fall like i think we won like if3 the skiing fest X Dance, I want to say, best document. I forget all of them, but then they were really cool after that. They were like, you're right, Tanner's cool with it, then we're cool with it. They ended up like doing a 30 city tour with that film or something where they would just show it. At, what was it called again? Like a Lion. The Let me just look at the poster. Like a Lion, the true story of legendary skier Tanner Hall. And so, yeah, that was like a huge breakthrough in my career where I'd just been making these ski movies, but then you know, thanks to Tanner and Eric and a bunch of other people, like, and, and in that time, I kind of was making like punk videos <laughs> for like with this guy, Justin Staggs, who's an amazing director, illustrator. And he had done like all these videos for like Epitaph and Fat Records and, and you know, all those bands that we used to love. And so I, I remember like in 2006, I want to say, um, we made a bunch of projects together and that's some of the, those, those are some of the videos you mentioned earlier. Like we ended up doing videos for against me. Yeah. Which one, which was the against me one? So this is going to show my age, but I believe it was, um, it was called like stop. Um, it was like when their big record came out. It's like Miami, right? Was that on Miami or is that on the one on, um, oh, fuck. What is it? It's like stop something, something, dun, dun. Yeah, time to think. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, that was like when they were supposed to be like the next big thing. But I remember like we released the video and what was cool about Tom Gable, the lead singer at the time, who now has found some notoriety as Laura Jane Grace. Yeah. Tom was like super cool at the time. And like, I remember being on Warp Tour. <laughs> we had just made another video or Stags made another video where like he was a big replacements fan, like everyone. We released these videos and he was showing me on the tour bus, like all the people like talking trash, like, oh, this is what happens when you sign to a major label. Like you start releasing crappy videos like this, except for Tom Gable, like paid for those videos because he wanted to work with Stags because he was a fan of like Fat Records and Epitaph and stuff. And so he made a music video from his own idea. And it was kind of like copying the bastards of young music video. I just remember reading the comments and it's like they got it so wrong because he he paid for those videos. And then I think the label like reimbursed him when they weren't totally crappy. But I remember on that stop video, they like ended up reshooting it in L.A. to make it an election video because they were like, you know, this political punk band. Wait, so he he talked shit about it or he didn't talk shit about it? Uh, Well, no, I'm saying the people on the, the bus who were commenting, this was kind of in the era where you first started like post something and get immediate reactions oh, where people yeah they were like saying the label forced them to make these bad videos but what i'm saying is that tom gable like basically was like i want to make these videos and with people i i want to make them with not like with the video commissioner or something did picking. you read did you listen to tranny no um but is that is that is that her book laura jane grace's yeah it's fucking great but when she's talking as him back in the day like he's just like just talking about how much of a fucking asshole he was until he like transitioned over to all the drugs he was doing he was talking shit about like all of these videos i don't think he, ta he mentioned yours but there was the one where they got the red wine pouring on him and stuff and he you know it's it was it's it's so fast if you get the audiobook she reads it and it's fucking great okay it, yeah it, 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 it's this balance of him transitioning to Laura and then talking about against me's growth and how people just fucking hated them when they started to, to get big. It's such a great book. Again, I'm not a, I, I went to the Laura Jane Grace show maybe like right after the pandemic or right when you could go, it opened up and we talked for a while, but it was definitely like one of those things where we didn't get into like anything about the past. She was like, oh, I'll say hi to Stags. But I do remember uh, when I was in the car with, with Tom, <laughs> like driving to set or something. And I had this like guitar that was like a Sears guitar from 1973 where you put batteries in it. And I so, used to always bring it and like have whoever we were making a music video for play it. But um, at the time, Tom was like, oh, I used to have this guitar or like just shredding it and like rocking out on it. And that was like a cool memory. And then also remember, I don't again, I don't know the exact story, but. He was generally surprised at the time that 
they released this great record and like got so much negative backlash from like the punk community. And it, all it reminded me of was like Green Day and like what they went through. But like a story where like they the band or him, he went into like a coffee shop and there was like a sign that said like rock against me. And it was like some dude in a coffee shop, like making fun of him. And he like tore the poster down and got in a fight with this person. <laughs> and, like, it's yeah. That's in the book. He got arrested for that too or something. All I'm saying is like that dude was like for sure punk. Whoever these people are that were like upset about it were probably just like attached to this idea that they knew something cool no one else did. And then everyone else had access to it. And then they were just like, I don't know, 25 percent of punk in that era. <laughs> if people now don't understand that that was like a thing because it was hard to find music and it. And you did kind of get this feeling like nobody else knew what you knew. Oh, yeah. I mean, but like I saw them play in San Diego in 2003 at a record store. There was this huge hard this punk scene. They were kind of elitist punk. The, yeah, pa- apparently sure elitists that love. Yeah, like they were they were the older punks. They were in their I can't say the older, but they're like like low, like, you know, early to mid 20s, like 20, 28 year old. old. Yeah. <laughs> just like, oh, I know the world. And just when that was the kind of group that lost their minds over it when they're like wait a minute our band got big and you're like shut the fuck up you yeah fucking idiots yeah. i mean but that's the thing is that it was like zine culture and it was like the people controlling the zines kind of controlled the backlash narrative well let me take this back let me let me take this back to kind of it's a good segue there because i want to learn a little bit about the minnesota punk scene and then i want to kind of break down uh, like harvesting crust a little bit more and and all that stuff so kind of go backwards so like the punk scene what were were you going to local shows or was it just was it just club shows for you guys so this is where i feel like i'm gonna be less savvy about the actual bands because i really didn't go to a ton of shows I, i i mean i went to as many shows as like i could but i wasn't like one of those punk fixture dudes who was like going to every single show at the 7th Street entry to find every new band. But I had a lot of friends who did that. Um, I would go to like the shows that interest me at like First Avenue a lot. And a lot of them were like bands that were already kind of like going to be big, but weren't big yet. I remember going to like No Doubt and 311. Okay. And, and I used to I love 311. <laughs> yeah. Like, like well, you know, it wasn't, there were punk people that I was friends with. They're like, oh, you can't go to this show. It's not punk and you're like what are you talking about like, this is just like i had, I was friends with this guy b harden who's in hoax two and you know he's a pretty famous rollerblader and he's friends with like 311 and then i remember like going to the show i was talking to someone and they like it was this was i think this was before like sublime was huge some of the rollerblader dudes were friends with brad noel and so i somehow like drop name i don't remember how i did it but i got backstage and was like hanging out with gwen stefani because she's like how do you know brad noel i'm like i don't but they had recorded together before they were famous on one of those and it was in a rollerblading video so had i not been part of that scene and known that song existed before it was out i probably wouldn't have ended up hanging out with them yeah like that era was like was like i almost feel like i missed it a little bit because i didn't see as many bands as I should have. Like, I think I saw like bad religion, green day, like a lot of the bands that now almost play as a joke in that scene. I was seeing them like, because I, I've got like a zoinks record. I don't know if anyone even knows they are. Yeah. 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 (laughs) But they're from like Nevada maybe, or like Las Vegas. And my recollection was like, I went to the like hardest core punk shop in Minneapolis called extreme noise. Right. My mom like dropped me off in our station wagon because I didn't want her to like didn't want them to see me. And like I remember we like walked in, me and my friend Eric walked in. <laughs> this guy with like literally like face tattoos, piercings, like the punkest punk. He was probably like 35 and like I'm sure he hated us. He was yeah. like, Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just I sent you a I just sent you a link because I interviewed the guy from Zoink. Oh no way. Well, I just remember him being like, What bands do you like? Cause we were asking him what's cool to listen to. I was like, I don't know, like Green Day and Zoinks and Screech and Weasel or whatever. Like I had gotten a Lookout Records like bundle where I had ordered Screech and Weasel and they just sent me a bunch of Green Day and Operation Ivy records and stuff. And I'd never heard of any of these bands. These were like six inch records, two songs or something on each side. And this guy's like, looks at me and he's like, okay, follow me. And he like slowly lumbers over to these like CD cases. And he's like, this is what you want. 
and he like hands me this this CD with like death metal, like Oakland Raiders logo. And he's like, this is what you want. It's satanic rap. And then he just walks away. <laughs> and like, you know, I just remember like talking to these people who were like trying to explain to me how lame these these base, base city bands were, like how only cool bands are like New Jersey, hardcore Danzig or I don't know, like what they were into anyway. But your scene ended up kind of being the like one of the hearts of punk rock in that era for like the cool kids. And I was like just action sports guy who liked this like pop punk melodic (laughs) like so you got to realize in that era it kind of fractured that scene and i was definitely part of like the the like posers you know i wasn't like going to shows and like punching people and like bleeding (laughs) well it's funny though because we because you mentioned jersey that's where i grew up and i got into the scene just because i was playing in a band other than that i would like to go see bigger bands you know i would go see local bands to support the scene but i would love to go we'd go to the city and see face to face and like Weston and um, fucking Christ, there's so many fucking bands, uh, Suicide Machines and shit like that. Yeah, they, I think they were from Minnesota. They, Suicide Machines from Detroit. Wait, wait, wait a minute. I could, I just know that the old bass player was from Detroit because someone told me he got a star on his hand because people usually show to uh, Michigan with their right hand and they, ah. they point to that to show where they're from. And someone said he got a star on his thumb. He'd always have to get it replaced because the skin would just come off all the time. So that's the only reason <laughs> I think I know about that. But it was just funny because we're growing up in this time and we're getting into the scene the same time as we're watching these videos you guys are putting out. So you could, you know, it's like you could sit here and say that, but you, you also, did you film and edit Harvesting the Crust or which part? Yeah. So Dan Jensen was a pro rollerblader. He was, I think, pretty close with Steve Thomas where they... We realized in Minneapolis there was a bunch of other rollerbladers. We met Steve and we were like, and like John Robinson, and we're like, oh, like they're really good. Dan just would film everything because he had like a camcorder, like a pretty high end camcorder. And then he realized like I would just like, I was like kind of weird and I would just like stay up all night and like work nonstop on stuff. And at the time I was like editing together like VHS clips to make like these weird v you know vhs like you would just wait till something weird came on the tv and record it yeah my buddies do that i remember that. yeah and I, I don't know like i think i like probably learned about it from a zine but i i don't remember any reason for doing it other than me and my friend justin bram and jake roski from high school would just hang out and do this like stuff and just try to entertain each other well he was like hey we're editing late night we're gonna like sneak into this editing facility so we don't have to pay and if we stay up all night before the next session they'll just let us be in there illegally or something so we would just stay up all night making that movie that dude has gone on to make pretty awesome company called mixtus where he does a lot of stuff um i looked up your stuff which by the way is cool it's like motion graphics right yeah dude yeah Yeah. and i feel like a lot of people who started in action sports got kind of into that because like i mentioned brian smith earlier who's now like a famous celebrity photographer in la or like vinnie minton the rollerblader i think is a filmmaker connor o'brien i want to say is like like a, he's a um like cam op or a DP in LA and like another weird connection is like Justin Pierre from Motion City Soundtrack introduced me to Bill McShane. You know that guy? Yeah, Bill McShane and Eric Mellon like in Ultimate Fake Book. I yeah, I talked to them. I saw you did an episode with John Cheese. Oh, do you know John Cheese? Oh yeah, for sure. Get the fuck out of here. Everybody knows that guy. Dude, this guy's a legend. Um, <laughs> so like oh, John God. Cheese, my. How do I transition this to, for anyone to make any sense who doesn't know John Cheese is? But well, John Cheese, anyone doesn't know him. He was a uh, like a roadie for a long time. I did an interview with him. He roadied for My Chemical Romance. And there's a funny story of him getting kicked out, and then he was with Piebald for a really long time. Yeah. And now he's a realtor in New Jersey, and he plays a cover punk band in Ma- in Maplewood. But he was like, like he's the kind of dude where you would like hear his name if you were touring on like Warp Tour or something. You're like, okay, that's not a real person, but you know, whatever. Or like the story had to have grown because we just all tell stories and we change it slightly and whatever. But I was touring with like Limbeck or something, or I'd done music videos. Yeah, he was their roadie, I think, for a while. Yeah, so I think it was like Doghouse Records. I was doing work for them. I just remember like going to the show to like meet them before they like let us do their video. And there was like this dude and he like comes up on stage and introduces them like in this really, they used to be like a punk band, but they turned into like an alt country band somehow. But then like they were still being booked with the all American rejects and motion city, all these like, who's that Limbeck? 
Yeah, oh, but yeah. they're an amazing band. I still listen to them in regular rotation, but I just don't know why they ended up in the punk scene, but they're in the punk scene, and this dude comes out with like a full beard, and he's just like introducing this band in like almost like a monster truck way, and then he goes, hey guys, do you know what comes before part B? And everyone's just like totally uninterested. It's like the opening band for some other famous band, <laughs> and he just goes, party! and like slams a beer (laughs) and then everyone like goes nuts and like by the end of that show though everyone had like you know how it is at venues where like nobody cares and you almost feel bad for the band yeah all these other random people who weren't even punkers like ended up like crowding in and they just rocked so like they were just so good at like playing music patrick their guitarist is phenomenal anyway like i just became immediate friends with all these dudes we made probably, I think we made like two or three videos for him and John Cheese was just always there. And I remember like driving through the desert in the middle of the night with this dude <laughs> and just like bonding and like all those guys, like before I got married, I like went out to LA and like stayed with like um, Rob, the lead singer and hung out with him. And those dudes are just so awesome. Again, it's like um, almost famous. You're just in the van with these people you've never met or heard of. And then like all of a sudden you're like best friends. And that's just who John cheese was, you know? Wait, did you hang out with like the guys in the, um, Oh my God, like Amy Madden and Fiddler records. And then this guy, Jeremy Weiss, did you meet them at all? I know who you're talking about, but I didn't. I think, I think the connection for me was doghouse because John like worked with them or something or Rama. Do you know Rama? No. Okay. Big Wheel Recreation. He was the. That was like a whole. That was a whole group up there. So I was like, I wonder if this connects with that. Whole yeah, thing. I think. I think that's what you find is there's just threads in every scene where. So I ended up doing a music movie for Motion City soundtrack. So their lead singer Justin Pierre brought. We hung out with Limbeck like for fun, I think, <laughs> or something. We ended up doing their music videos for a while, and then I met like cousin Justin. I met like Vinny Fiorello and like. All these people, like, at one point, like, because so Justin Pierre is, like, a really close friend of mine now. Um, That's cool. Yeah, and, like, he was in my wedding. And, like, but, you know, before that, I was, like, who is this alcoholic dude? Like, I was friends with his sister. So the first time I met him, he was, like, blacked out at a bar. Um, And he's, like, one of the sweetest people you'll ever meet. But, you know, when I met him, he wasn't. And he's sober now. I I I saw some interview where he was talking about that. Yeah, I mean, he's like a legit genius. Like I met so many musicians over the course of like my weird entree into this whole like punk scene slash music video space and um but he's like legit. He'll like write a melody, play it for you, be like, "Oh, you can use this in a movie or something." But if you don't record it, like he won't remember, but it's like in your head. And so many times I've like been like, "Hey, what about this track?" and he's like, "Oh, I don't even remember." You know, he's kind of got like um Swiss cheese brain, I think from doing doing whatever he did in like the late 90s and early 2000s but like we're still friends to this day and like he basically probably is like i don't know 33 percent responsible for my career probably because he would just be like hey what are you doing this weekend and then i'd be like nothing and he'd be like we're like we would go to la and make a movie with patrick stump from fallout boy like that's what we did one weekend with no preparation and no, like normally, you know, to make a movie, it might take three or four weeks of prep. But he would have one weekend off of, you know, touring or something. My guess is that I think he, if he had something to do, he wouldn't drink. I remember arguing with their manager once who was like, you're a bad influence on him. But actually, it was the opposite. And so I hung out with that, one of those managers at like Sundance Film Festival one time. And he was like, hey, you know, we're appreciative of you that you like hang out with Justin and he doesn't drink. But yeah, he he quit drinking and and he's like one of those people where I, when I tell the story, it's like I've had friends that, you know, went to treatment but didn't really try to get better. Our relationship is like, you know, better than it's ever been. And we like did a podcast together for five years and like, but um, yeah, he's a, he's an unbelievable human. And um, that would be like an average day hanging out with him. He'd be like, oh, they want to do a music video for um, Mark Hoppus or something. And I'm Jesus. like, you know, flashback to like going to Warp Tour and like being rejected trying to go backstage to meet those guys. I think he had like this side project called Plus 44 where we were going to do a music video, but then Justin relapsed and ended up in like treatment or something. And so relapsing is a part of recovery. Was well, that why they just jumped off the, they were on the tour. I just saw the Elmer can reject some in Raleigh and I saw them, but motion city tra- soundtrack was on the bill and they didn't show up. Yeah. I think he had a back. Pr- I don't know. I'm, I'm like not close to his music scene. So I, I like follow him, but I follow like a different account where I don't always know like the backstory. 
So let me, so I don't know how to segue this, but I want to jump back because I really want to talk about like the music part of Harvesting the Crust and like you guys filming it. And I think like talk about the bands and stuff and like your connection really kind of connects to how you started with getting in these bands. So before you start kind of talking about like breaking down the video and like certain scenes and shit, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to just that like, you know, minute by minute, but the soundtrack, did you guys get any permission to use any of those songs? Um, My recollection of that is like Epitaph or someone really smart over there, like maybe Brett Gurowitz or someone realized that if we just send a bunch of CDs to anyone, like they're going to put them in these videos and these kids are going to buy the records. I don't know that, but my recollection is like Steve and Dan realized like, Hey, we'll just like call these people. And they like sent a box and it was like, you know, no effects, bad religion, like Sam, I am, I don't remember it was rich kids on drugs. Yeah. Rich kids, rich kids on LSD. Or rich kids on LSD, um, yeah. sort of like Jawbox, maybe Jawbreaker, just the weirdest collection of, and it had like a letter. Or something was like, do whatever you want, but like I don't think we got like music releases. That was also in an era where people were still cool and weren't trying to like steal money for no reason from some weird like you know oversight. And it's like we weren't, we you know you could pay to have it published, but like we were punk rock. We were just putting these videos out for fun, basically. <laughs> to show rollerblading like it didn't enter our brains that it was like there was like a copyright infringement component it makes total sense though because if you watch the video you guys are just like you guys are there's a mix of some of you guys are hitting hitting curbs and just you know doing like a front slide across the curb and then you got steve thomas who's doing these create this crazy shit and there's like this in between with some of you guys skating and some people weren't at his level and then you got these skits that you guys are doing. So you just saw that it was just a bunch of you guys just dicking around and saying, well, let's just make something funny, which is, which is, I think, why the video, like, people really liked it. Yeah, totally. And that was, like, Dan Jensen's, like, touch as, like, a director. I was, like, 15 or something and 16 or whatever. And, like, you know, we just did this stuff. But I remember I made, like, a simple shoe commercial for that. We made the commercials, like, not realizing, like, we could probably charge them because we had like this visibility in that era. Like I think that movie sold like thousands and thousands of copies. Like at the time it was like just purely doing it for fun. And, and, and there was, you gotta realize there wasn't that skateboarder friction yet. They kind of thought it was cool because we were skateboarders. Right. But then like two years later, it was like, there was a lot of uh, animosity. Well, that guy's in it too, though. There's that guy in the video. There's that famous scene where he's talking about hitting rollerbladers with his car door yeah. and you're behind him like sticking your your tongue out to look like it's in his ear and shit what what, what the fuck was that whole okay. thing so that guy i guess he's famous in omaha nebraska i think his name was like wolfman or the werewolf something and he was like a really good skateboarder who i think like something happened like maybe he got on drugs or he quit or drinking or something happened but he would like hang out in skate spots and like yell at people and so he just starts ranting and what his rant is about, this is probably later in the filming of that movie. So like 90, late 94, whether that beef had just started. And he was like, he was like, listen, man, I'm not going to beat you guys up or whatever, like, cause I'm a skateboarder and you're rollerbladers. And then Steve, which, you know, he was a skateboarder and I was a skateboarder. He's like, we're skateboarders too. So anyway, we end up talking to this guy, but he's, he's ranting about harvesting the crust from, from their eyes. And that's like a punk reference that I didn't get at the time. Oh, so that's what the that's what you guys named the film after. Yeah, and that's where Dan I think picked oh. up on that 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 was amazing. And then there's another dude if you remember where there's a guy in Minneapolis who was like a crackhead and he's the one who introduces the movie. So both these guys and I ran into this guy like years later and I have audio of him where I just recorded it. I used to carry this is before iPhones and stuff, but I used to carry a recorder on me and I always record weird stuff and I remember him talking about how him and his like girlfriend were like smoking crack and like he was homeless because his his parents used to like give him like cocaine to like he just had this horrible life story he tells me over like you know 30 40 minutes i realized who it was because i was like oh my gosh this is the guy from harvesting the crust who like i'm naming off all the people in the video and he's like got a knife <laughs> or something oh my do you remember this scene? yeah i'm i'm literally i'm watching it now on mute like it's on youtube the whole video is on youtube and um yeah i'm like passing by because there's that and there's the secret section so i'm trying to figure out yeah the secret section definitely was like stuff that could we were like editing out some of the stuff that should have been there but this guy's like i run into him i don't know this is probably 2002 and that was filmed in 1994 or 95 and i'm like oh my gosh do you remember this he had no idea and i'm like dude you're in a movie <laughs> like 
hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people have seen you get doing this rant. And he's like telling me about like, yeah, last night we had to go to the emergency room because I got a novelty condom. And uh, my girl wanted me to like it was like a troll doll with like the crazy hair on the end of a condom. And he like. His girl wanted him to use it and like didn't work out. And I won't tell his graphic version of the story, but like, yeah, just I wonder what that guy's doing now. Like, if he ever got help, or and I remember like trying to talk to him and asking him if he wanted help. And he's just like, nah, man, I just want to smoke crack. But anyway, like, so many of those moments that are captured, like, kind of come back on themselves and circle in some way. Well, there's that one scene in, you know, John Robinson, I think he's the one who's drunk in that in secret section, right? Yeah. Um, did he. Like, did he see that before you guys put that in the, the film? Yeah, I don't remember any of us caring, but I remember being very nervous because he was, like, really young. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> like, it never really caused us any problems or anything. But I feel like now that's, like, every kid faces that where YouTube, like, whatever their friend recorded on their iPhone can come back to haunt them. But John's such a, like, good dude and, like, you know, he's just a nice person and, like, I don't know that any of the people who saw it cared, and I don't remember the distributor caring or anything. Like, I don't even know if they knew about it. Well, because you guys did that, my buddy Rob, who I mentioned earlier, he would always bring a camcorder around, so we would record ourselves to make our own video, and he would bring it to our party. So there's video footage of us at parties just drunk as shit at the age of 17. So we were, like, mimicking you guys. <laughs> well, and that's the weird thing. So but the people got to realize jackass was not a thing. This was 1994, 95. So we were just, we just had video cameras with us. So we would film everything. And then, you know, at the end, we just cut it together. And that's for people who don't know about at the very end of the tape, right? In that era, there's VHS tapes. So there would be like, we'd pretend like the movie ends and then nobody ever watches it once it goes to like fuzz because that's just what happened. It would have maybe two minutes or three minutes after the credits of just be like black video laid down and then it would go fuzzy. So we just made it so eight minutes afterwards we had a section hidden if you watch the video till the end and it was just like debaucherous stuff with 15 year olds so basically my theory here is jackass stole our idea <laughs> and like uh, but you know there were other movies like whiskey had, had done that with boozy the clown well bam Margera at that point was doing um what was the fuck cky so he was doing cky i think that was that 2000 time. Because I remember there was CKY2K, which was like 98, 99 or some 97. So this is 1994. And I remember we tried to pitch it as a show to MTV, like through the Sky New. And like they were like, yeah, that's dumb. And then like we never <laughs> heard back. And then like it was a show, like however many years later. So I want to talk about Video Group for a second. So there's a scene in Harvesting Crest where you're like, have you seen it? And this guy's like, no, I want to. Is that the guy who did all the Video Group movies? Yeah, that's Dave Payne. He uh, he made Video Groove, um, and and then I think he went on to work for like a TV station for years. And now he started his own film production company, and he's super talented, super cool, and he's still involved in rollerblading. He's a DJ, great dude. And my quick Dave Payne story is uh, my I told you the guys that ran, you know ran our company. They had started another company which sucked. I got seizures. I told them they sucked at a trade show. They came back and we're like, well, how would we not suck? And I'm like, hire me. And then they did, which was crazy. And then I got like to go a year later, we were like showing our new product and had this amazing team. And and Dave Payne was like, you know, influential in our world at that time and very much like a uh, cheerleader saying we need more of this. Like, you know, because we had released our video and he was releasing his and Dave Payne was like, you know, influential in our world at that time and very much like a uh, cheerleader saying we need more of this because we had released our video and he was releasing his. But I remember like, the CEO was like super weird dude. And like, we were going to sponsor this tour and we had everything set up. And then he just like, yeah, we're not doing that anymore. And I had to call like one of my friends and be like, Hey, I know like we're supposed to do this, but we can't. And he's like, you're already on the flyer. Like we already printed like tons of the stuff. And so they like had to cross them out by hand. And I just felt horrible. And I was like, this guy's never going to talk to me again. And then like, he just hit me up next time he was in town and we went golfing and like, he was just was like, ah, I don't care. Like, <laughs> you know, it was just one of those moments where I was horrified because of my own like weird, I guess you'd call it ethos, you know, like, but you know, that company ended up kind of, you know, our company, United Urethane ended up kind of going, going away. And I remember like I had a decision to sell it to, a, um, 
like mail order catalog company. And I remember not doing it, which was like super stupid because I thought like they were lame and we needed brick and mortar shops to keep the community together. And that was like my punk rock moment that I probably regret because I could really use that money right now. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but yeah, like, I don't know, like a lot of times what you realize is the, the people who aren't close to it come up with their own story and then like that's what gets out there. Real quick, if you're looking for an explainer video or someone to do motion graphics for your company, check out my company, drive80.com, and you can email me at mike at drive80.com for more info. That's all I got to say. So now back to the interview. Yeah, it seems like that happened a lot. Actually, to that point, is there is it true that Brian Smith was in Playgirl? Yeah, I have the magazine, uh, but it wasn't his fault is my understanding. I don't know. Like, you should have Brian Smith on the show because he's like super successful. Um, but I, I don't know. The, there's two different stories, so I don't know which one's true. Well, the one I know is true is in my basement right now. I have a shot where I think he did a modeling thing where they trick people into like getting their rights and then they like put it into ads. So he's just a good looking dude, super talented, super cool. They like took that ad and like it was in magazines. I don't know if he would care. I, I don't. I'm sure he doesn't care now because he's like crushing it and he's super amazing photographer. Yeah, I think, yeah, because I remember hearing about, I mean, this is when we were like 16 or 17. Again, this was, it kind of goes to that whole ethos of, so in Video Groove there, I think it's Video Groove 2, VG2, and it, it's like, it gets a little dark when they start including like New York City and there's smoke and pot and there's, you know, it's like darker rap and shit. And I remember you guys were such a lighthearted thing and we were watching these videos. I was like, oh, this this world of teenagers looks scary. There was this one guy from there. from He used to go to the Brooklyn Banks. His name is Ryan something. Ryan Jackalone? Yeah. Did he die of a heroin overdose? That's a good question. I, I, I Last I heard, he was doing fine in, in New York. I could probably have this supercomputer in my pocket here. Hold on a second. <laughs> Another reason why I love this podcast is there's these things I remember from when I was 17 or 20, and now I'm learning all of these things where like, oh, no, this isn't true, or this is true, and I'm like, wow, this is crazy. Yeah, and that's the thing. Zine culture would get stuff wrong all the time because it wasn't like they were vetting anything. They were like 17-year-old kids putting out punk rock scenes. But I guess that that's right. I guess that's how a, like a piece of how news would get around is you'd get these zines in from somewhere, and they would talk about this shit. I think I would have heard that, but so many people died in New York. Ron Hunter's brother, Harold Hunter, died and he was in Kids. And if you think about that movie and that culture, I remember hanging out with the New York dudes for the first time and they were like so far advanced. We were in the back of like a tour bus and they were like getting these girls to do like sex acts. And I remember just being like, whoa, like I was so sheltered and I grew up in like Minnesota Christian, like I was in church or something when they were like doing whatever they were doing on a Thursday night. I just remember like they were all really cool and that was the culture. And like, we didn't really judge anyone for that at that time. We just became friends with all of them. I think that might be why that difference came across. Well, what was like, was it intimidating when you would skate with those guys at the banks? I remember like Ryan was super cool and like, he was just really like, um, I didn't smoke weed. This is a weird thing. I never drank, never did drugs. And that wasn't because I was on pharmaceuticals from like the companies that made me take them for seizures. It was just, I just never did it. Cause I decided like my, you know, dad was an alcoholic. I'm like, I'm just never drinking. And I made that decision, but he was like everyone in the ski and rollerblade skateboard scenes. There was just a lot of different people that had been exposed to a lot of drugs or, or alcohol or whatever. None of those guys ever cared. Like I never felt peer pressure. I never felt anything other than we were just stoked to be skating with them. And like, we realized New York, Minnesota, California, like we were not as good as the guys from Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> like they were the best in the world at that time. Like Dave, what's his face with the glasses who did that really long? Dave Kalesh, yeah. Yeah, he did that long ass rail in Mad Beef. Yep. So Dave Flesh, Nick Galliano, Mark Neppel, all the Omaha dudes, like we became friends with them and it was only a seven hour drive. We put them in our video because we had like visibility. They were just really good. And like Steve was so far ahead of the curve that we would go to those like New York spots and L.A. for like a year. They were like, oh, my gosh. Like and they the way they talked like, yo, kid. That was ill. And like, <laughs> I came back to school that next year after the tour. And they would make fun of me because I had like developed some of these like words and mannerisms from the New York <laughs> dudes and the LA dudes. And I like still had a Minnesota accent. So I like kind of cobbled it all together. And they were like, why are you talking so weird? And I was like, what do you mean? You know, that era was just so fun. And there was like no pretense, really. It was cool meeting Chris Edwards after watching him two years straight or Arlo or whoever. 
it's not that different from the punk scene where you listen to a band your whole life, then you meet the person and they're not that cool yeah. or they're really cool. You just never know which way it's going to go. And so our scene was no different. They were like horrible people that I just don't like ever to this day. And they were amazing people. Did you meet some people? Well, you don't have to say their names, but did you meet some people in that scene where you're like, oh, wow, no, you, you suck? Yeah, like I got into a fight with this photographer guy. He didn't remember me but years later i was basically like the decision maker who's like if he gets a job or not and i was like i don't care like he's and then he was like the nicest ever to me <laughs> like people are just like that i'm sure i'm that guy to someone else you mentioned the seizure thing a couple of times have you have you, do you still got them yeah so i haven't had a seizure in 12 years which is amazing or 10 years i think i, I was trying to remember the other day but i'm off pharmaceuticals which is great if you don't have a seizure for five years and you can like prove it, then you can get off of the drugs, which are really expensive. A lot of my money from the time I was a kid was like spent on like making sure neurologists could like buy their like third helicopter. Well, I don't know, whatever it was, but it was a very expensive business to have seizures. And so once I got off that medication, which is really expensive, and then you know, no one would insure, you know, before Obamacare, you couldn't really get insured. So it's super expensive. I just every day I'm stoked that I don't have them and they might come back someday. But for right now, like, yeah, I just I don't worry about it. I, I have to constantly think about how to not have a seizure. So I still that's just a habit because it would always happen from movements in my right leg, which, you know, skateboarding and action sports. Yeah, I was wondering what the connection was there. I was like thinking the fast speed because I know that if you watch something like video games, it's it's just too fast for you. I was like, maybe going down a hill was just too much for your eyes. But I was like, I don't even know how that would trigger that. Yeah, no, mine's not photophotic, you know, not light sensitivity. It's um something with the movement in my right leg. It might be because I grew really fast from the time in like 94 to like, I was in a double page spread in like inline magazine, I want to say, or one of those magazines where the first shot of me, I look like a little kid. The, the the final photo shoot, I like look like a, you know, like a 17 year old dude. And I went through puberty like late, but really fast. I think they think that it might've been cause I was growing really fast that year or something, mm. but they don't know. And that was the first thing my, my neurologist told me. He's like, you know, you're going to pay us all this money, but we don't really know what we're doing. Cause we can't like poke and prod at the brain. So we're just going to like try a bunch of stuff and see what works. And then like nothing worked, but I got into the behind the camera. So now I, you know, own a company called Omnifusion Media Production, where I basically make movies, motion graphics, whatever comes down the pipe, just like, you know, that scene, it's, it's kind of tricky um, yeah. to, to navigate, but it's because that is what we did as a form of like trying to get sponsored or document the like shows, or, you know, it was just a natural progression from owning the rollerblade companies to making like ski movies to like making commercials for fortune 500 companies or whatever well, i mean that's why i do this shit because i grew up was going to go to what did like two two semesters of college failed out and then i just went on tour with a band for, like for about two and a half years and we on the road we even met some guy he had his own clothing line his name was lee shit uh, lee ramsdell and he was from north carolina which is funny because i live here now he had his own like he had his catalog and t-shirts and i remember just always keeping this in the back of my mind and then seeing you guys and it'd be scribe or like arlo's company with the senate, senate senate and shit like that and so now like for me i've got the podcast that i do which kind of for me is almost like a band and i could just make my own merch or just do these episodes which is so much fun i have this comic that i can kind of like do merch or just make my own thing and then the animation shit i really do a lot i pretty much do all of this shit because of that scene and then seeing the shit that you guys did because i was like i want to do that. oh that's awesome yeah like 100 percent. i mean even like with scribe actually i had a question here um because i remember seeing that and i'd be like what is this what's the scribe thing like are these guys doing this like what's the whole story behind that did you guys like have a company or did you just just put your logo on some skater shirts and say you're sponsored yeah, so that's a good question. Um, we met Dan Jensen and Steve Thomas and uh, John Robinson, like at like the Metrodome had like a rollerblade at the dome day, and we were like doing handrails in like a part of the Metrodome where the Vikings play, where you're not supposed to go. And then I remember going to this thing called the Aqua Jam and seeing like Steve Thomas was like so much better than everyone, except maybe like John Schmidt or something who all these dudes, we would just go rollerblading. And and I think Steve and Dan were really the ones that kind of realized like we should do something. And we were, you know, skateboarders. So we just copied what the skateboarders are doing. And we realized like the 
rollerblades were expensive and they'd break if you didn't have these little like grind plates. So they started selling grind plates and those were like a huge hit. And then Senate had metal ones and there was a big debate like metal versus plastic. I don't remember who won, but we sold a ton of those grind plates as Scribe Industries. And yes. like, it's cool because in Minnesota, there's a famous artist named Adam Terman who was, he drew the original Scribe logo with like this dude wrapping around his like neck around and like grinding this rail. That guy like crushes it now, but he was just like a passionate artist. And we just try to find other people who are passionate. Um, we became friends with a lot of like the punk bands because we were like putting these, you know, we got to, I guess, some credibility around the visibility before you could like fake it and buy like Instagram followers or something. Like you had to like... <laughs> develop your own community of like-minded people and like those guys were so cool john robinson was so cool me and him would just like drive around together and like look for skate spot play punk rock music in the car and every component of life had like some meaning and every day was like cooler than the last you were inventing a trick every day and what, what what's kind of cool is like i realized in like a lion which was the tanner hall red bull movie with oakley and you know these pretty big companies that i was like a huge fan of growing up watching glenn plake and like he's in the movie you know but it was just a progression of what we went through in 1994 95 and they were going through it in like 2000 2002 because snowboarding was huge then but but skiing had actually kind of eclipsed it by that time yeah there was i remember there was uh the sled dogs remember those they were the worst fucking invention <laughs> in the goddamn world. I got them for Christmas one year. It was like 300 bucks. And I remember I brought them to this uh, Mountain Creek in, or no, Hidden Valley in Jersey. I couldn't stand still because they were just basically, I was, you're on plastic. So you couldn't, you just slid the whole time. I was like, this is, I was like, and then uh, what's his face? We were talking about before the dude with the glasses from Omaha. Uh, Dave Kalesh. Dave Kalesh. So he, I saw he was like a sponsor for them and he's flying down the mountain and all shit. I'm like, Oh, I'm going to be like him. And I couldn't even like, I, I had to hold on to friends because it just, it would just, <laughs> yeah. just keep fucking moving. Yeah. It was not the best invention. However, I think Solomon made like a short ski to try to capitalize yes. on rollerblading success and that massive market we developed skateboarders to their credit really saw that we were taking a percentage of their market share and did a really good job of like trying to make it not cool with the cool people. But like skiing kind of went through that too, where there were those short skis. I think they were called snowblades. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. And I remember meeting one of the sled dog investors once, and they were like really mad that like their invention didn't get as big as like snowblades did for it like two years. It was such a piece of shit. Yeah, it was. It was <laughs> definitely like they would approach you trying to like access your audience, but you controlled it back then. It wasn't another third party company reselling your audience to someone else or back to you. You knew like if. Steve Thomas said something or Arlo or, er or Chris Edwards or any of the Eric Iberg, any of the people in these industries, they were kind of like gatekeepers to make sure that like what they knew about the ethos didn't get poached by some like Fortune 500 corporation. And I thought that was really cool. And that ties into the punk rock scene as well, you know. So that ethos is still alive and it sort of hurts me with my company because I feel like I don't like hang out with one of my like friends who's in a famous band and want to like post about it because it makes me feel gross, but I probably should. <laughs> but but yeah, that era was so amazing because Senate were our friends. Like we were competing against them in Harvesting the Crust. It's Senate's best riders and Scribe's best riders. I think that came through for people like you where to this day, I'll get stopped at like a mall or something like I was saying. And people are like, they just have that energy and it's so authentic because it's a sort of a time in their life that they remember with just a golden glow. Oh, totally. I mean, this, that defines my, I mean, I had just started driving. I just found my group of friends. So I'm still close to this day. And like we all, this was like the glue was the music, going to shows, playing shows, fucking skate videos, the skateboard videos. Like all of that shit, man. And it's like, oh, it's like a time capsule. That's why everyone loses their minds. Here's here's my prediction. If you can recapture that in 2025 or 26 and you make it a one-off moment that can't be watched alone on a YouTube video, that experiential thing is going to make a massive comeback because that's kind of what the new model kind of stole from people, I think. For example... I would be touring. I would end up making this up. But in New Jersey, hanging out with you. And that night, we would sleep on your couch and we would become lifelong friends and we would watch the new video that someone got. We would, because of Mark Neppel and these guys in Omaha, 
I met Bright Eyes, the Connor Oberst kid. I don't remember it, but they were telling me a story about how we were all hanging out. And they're like, you don't remember that night at that house? That's the kids. I don't know. And then they were like, he's going to be huge. And I was like, ah, eh, whatever. And then I remember him like playing at some crappy festival and he was like horrible at music. And I was like, this guy sucks. And then like five <laughs> years later, I was like a fan of his. That formula is like what the punk rock scene was in New Jersey. It was crossing over to skateboarding, rollerblading, snowboarding. And now it's like all that happens online, yeah. but you're not with another person. And that to me is like what I miss most for my kids. That's why I'm so stoked you're doing this project because the people that gravitate to that, like have that, that, and I'm not sure the next generation will. And I also totally understand that I'm like old man yelling at a cloud right now, <laughs> uh, but, but I'm curious to see what that is like when my kids are our age reminiscing about their youth. Yeah. I mean, there's a skate park that just opened up in Raleigh. It's called skate Raleigh, like SK eight, number eight Raleigh. And they, it's just, it's pretty basic, but it's cool they put it in. And I'm I'm driving by it. It's off of this main road, a Capitol Boulevard, and you'll see it's skateboarders and rollerbladers. And I just I just smile every time I roll by it. Like this is so I always think that shit like anyone who skateboards and rollerblades, I'm always like, This is so this is so cool you guys are still doing this. I mean, yeah, like rollerblading, I definitely when I got out of it, I was like, Ah, fuck that thing. It's so yeah. stupid. <laughs> but it's also it's one of those things where it blows up so the the core people they're doing it and then they and then that catches fire where they see videos like you guys put out and then everyone wants to do it and then it gets huge but then when it's like kind of not cool the core folk they still are doing it and it kind of just deflates again and it's like okay now it's back to where we wanted it to be yeah and that that formula coincided almost exactly with the punk rock curve What's weird is like Nirvana was a punk band that became an, some external force, put a label on them. All of a sudden, it's the lamest bands from like Northern California are now the coolest bands in 1995, 96, 97. And then like those guys are passe. And then it's like emo because those bands are copying the punk bands, but did it a little different. What's crazy is like that just surf cycles and cycles and cycles. But what's cool like about skateboarding and snowboarding is they've stayed generally cool um, whereas rollerblading was like a fad, quote unquote. But what's cool is then the people who are still doing it are cool because they don't care if it's cool or not. They just keep doing it. That's what I appreciate about those. When I see those guys, I'm like, okay, you're like, you're OG. Like, I wouldn't say purist. That kind of makes them like a dick, but they're doing it because they truly just like to do it. And that's exactly it. Because in, like my recollection of talking to like Green Day at the time was like, they didn't care because nobody liked them ever. <laughs> like they were trying to be cool with like the cool people in that scene. And they were like, you're, you're like the Beatles. You're singing about girls. Like you got to sing about like how mad you are about politics or something. I don't know. Like that was just my recollection. That formula for like a lot of the rollerbladers now, it's like a punchline. And I remember in my high school, even like talking to the quarterback of the football team who I was friends with and he used to rollerblade like for fun. And he was like saying something like, yeah, you know, Friday night, there'll be like 500 people screaming my name at the football game. And I was thinking in my head, like, well, I have like, I'm in all these like sections with like thousands of people watching all over the world probably hundreds of thousands of people, you know, when we actually realized the metrics after I started making the movies myself and tracking the analytics. But like, they didn't think that was cool. It would be like someone bragging to me right now, like, oh, I was like the best electronic RC boat racer or something. You know? <laughs> I think it's cool because I'm like, wow, how do you do that? The high school girls were like, why do you have like blood all over your elbows? You know, they didn't understand, <laughs> but they thought it was cool. I was on a magazine cover in Mighty Ducks, but that's why I liked it at the time. And then also just coming from skateboarding, when I started skateboarding, like you got made fun of for skateboarding. You got made fun of for being a punk. And then by 1997, it was like all the cool kids like thought it was cool. So to be part of that evolution was kind of fun. But it was cool when you saw someone be really good at it. I mean, you're right. Like skateboarding to this day, I've never... I've never seen in this time period where I've known skateboarding where they people are like, oh, skateboarding's so stupid. It's always the adults that are don't grind this curb or whatever, and now they have all these metal yeah. like things up. That which I, every time I see them, it makes me so mad. I'm like, just let them <laughs> do their thing, man. I mean, and that's the thing is like, what we were doing was so risky with no insurance like we lived in section eight apartment and like an old folks home my mom was like really cool because she just let me do it knowing that i wasn't getting paid that much you know uh what we should have been probably getting but there, there's a lot of themes like that that come out again in like a lie in the movie which like why do you take these risks for so little money when you could die i mean so if people haven't seen that movie you don't have to like skiing to watch it a lot of the punk rock and a lot of the um 
stuff we were going through as rollerbladers in that era come out in that movie because it's about being part of a subculture like New Jersey hardcore or New Jersey pop punk, where even inside of those factions, there's arguments happening that are sort of just universal tribal arguments where two different people can be so closely aligned, but like they'll find one little difference. <laughs> and and so like skiing or snowboarding or, act, I mean, rollerblading, all that stuff is to me, like, I just don't care anymore. I've heard like music people in the back of like tour buses, like really arguing over like some terminology about the punk, how you're classifying a band or some sort of guitar riff. Or, they get into it. And I just think that's passion coming out. I don't think it's like negative. There were just a bunch Lame people who made it negative in 1994 or 95. Yeah, that's come up a lot too, and I'm gonna start wrapping this up soon. But like, I um, that's definitely come up where, I mean, for me, when I was 16, I was all in the sellout thing and be like, oh, whatever. And then as an adult, when I started doing my own thing, I mean, you probably know this too. Once you start, once the money's coming in because it's all off of your blood, sweat, and tears, and you're not working for someone, you start to, you know, before that, you should definitely start seeing it. But even now, you're kind of like. Oh, that was really stupid. Someone was doing something they loved and was making money off of it, and I'm giving them shit for it as I'm living home for free. And and now I'm making money where I don't even know where my check's gonna come from in like four months. You know, it's yeah, <laughs> it's just like just describe my life where yeah, I book out these clients you know, just like you do with motion graphic stuff where I, you know, you can keep a client for three or four years, but then like some new boss comes in and they're like, we're going to re-up, you know, but you never, I think that these industries prepared me for that really well. The people who are punkers sleeping on people's couches, like you can't do that now that you have two kids, but that lifestyle prepared me for being like a nomadic, like freelance filmmaker. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. hundred um, percent. So yeah, it's like we were uniquely prepared by the, the nineties for our, important still like society now where i gotta make some super rich person like a little richer but like they just don't quite have enough money to pay like market and they just say well i'm just gonna have ai do it and i'm like all right good luck with that <laughs> what i was gonna say before that i totally like uh so i get i get sidetracked to the point of like there's like such a finite audience that might be interested in this but they're gonna be really interested just like you but for if for anyone else who's like an old crust punk from New Jersey or something that just is like us where we've come to this like comfortability in our like middle age where it's like, eh, whatever, it's America. You can do whatever you want. Just don't hurt someone else. For me, the whole thing, I made a movie that we never released in 2007 and eight. It's literally me, Justin Pierre, um, and this dude, Nels Lennis, who was like an actor who had moved to New York and had some success, but then came back to Minnesota. And then Justin Pierre, the lead starring Motion City soundtrack, always wanted to be a director. I always wanted to make a narrative feature film. Like that was why I started filmmaking. And I've never made a narrative feature film. I made feature docs. I've done all this stuff. Nels has had all the success. He came back and we were just like hanging out together, commiserating kind of like, and so we said like, what if, what if we make this movie this weekend, whatever is happening in our lives right now, we'll like film it and make a time capsule. Justin Pierre was like almost getting this movie done where he was going to have a budget I remember he called me. He was like, hey, it's not happening. I'm too busy. Like, didn't work out. And I was like, well, let's just make a movie about you getting rejected by the investor and like going to get advice from Vinny Fiorello, who owned Paper and Plastic, who had sold like Fueled by Ramen. And what I realized in that that weekend of making that movie is like we were all bitching about our amazing lives. But if I was like a 15 year old listening to me <laughs> talk, I'd be like, what is wrong with you? But but that's just this human nature. Yeah. Um, so, but we never released the movie because it's so embarrassing and so like raw. So you didn't release it just because of your own doing, just because you thought, oh, this is going to make us look stupid. I think, I think it wasn't as good as I wanted it to be. I had made um, music videos for like the Bouncing Souls or something where I knew I could go to Warp Tour that weekend and just go talk to the Bouncing Souls <laughs> or like these other bands I liked and inject that into the story because we knew then we weren't making the narrative feature film in Texas that Justin was excited about, but we were together that weekend and we had cameras and stuff. So I'm like, let's just film whatever happens. And we made this loose narrative where like we all talked to each other about real life things we had already kind of talked about and hashed over. So it had some structure, but you know, it was just disappointing to like, think you're going to make a narrative feature film with this like famous musician guy who like knows Vinny Fiorello, who you were a fan of their band. Yeah. <laughs> Like, yeah. less Jake. And then, you know, it doesn't work out. And, like, he's giving, like, these big, like, life lessons. He's like, he's like, hey, man, to, like, Justin Pierre, you're about to sign with the major label. He's, it's really cool stuff. It's just technically it's not very good. And it's, 
we, we probably should release it someday for the hundred people who care. The people on your podcast are those hundred people. I don't care if you were in 1970s or 60s or when it, like that snapshot is sort of the almost famous thing and, and kind of how I was going to try to end it to just not sound like totally like the old man yelling at the cloud was like when I was a Nirvana fan and ended up making like a Foo Fighters music video with Justin Staggs for Dave Grohl, those things don't just happen. I feel super lucky that like the punk rock tie in to like action sports led to like the filmmaking. And so, but yeah, if anyone out there wants to make a movie with me, I have like tons of movies <laughs> saved up. I just need to find an ultra rich benefactor who can light money on fire, making more shitty movies. And <laughs> that's how I became friends with Justin Pierre. We made like five movies together, like short films, you know, and probably like 15 music videos. But anyway, now that I'm older, I'm like, man, I should really start trying to do that again because I sort of see how the guy threatening me with AI was like saying that five years ago to try to knock four grand off the price. But now he actually has a point. You can do some stuff that might affect our industry. And I'm like, okay, what do I want to do with the time I have left to reinvent that feeling that you described when you first reached out to me about being in 1995, watching punk shows, watching action sports films. And like, for me, that might be it, you know, <laughs> what I'm not trying to do now. Well, there's, there's a bunch of projects that have gone on in the last couple of years there. It was like, I would Right around the, t it was almost like a lightning in the bottle thing again for the the people from the nineteen like late nineties, and now they wanted to kind of relive that or just reminisce. There's so this podcast came out, and it's not huge, but I definitely get a good amount of people. They'll message me or email me with these paragraphs of just how much this this time period means to them. And this this whole thing I love about this podcast is nothing of it is about me. It's all about the people that I talk about, which I love because it's like not like a it's not like a lens on me. It's me opening that lens on other people. So it's like this came out. There's a, a book called Where Are Your Boys Out that this guy Chris Payne did. There's this the last scene doc is coming out where he's like interviewing all of these punk bands from back then. And so all of this creative shit is happening around from that time. So maybe there is something that you, I don't know, there's something that you can do. You know, it's, you you can maybe wrap it around that or I don't know. Like even the fact that this hoax two reunion thing came out, I'm, I'm going to watch the shit out of this after we're done talking. I'm so excited. Yeah. And that's the, the thing is like your podcast can have as much of you as it needs to in it. Because like, to me, I could probably ask you like 30 more questions about motion graphics in your you know region and like how you find um sales funnels to keep it going and if you've experienced a downturn like with interest rates going up or like whatever that is there's a bunch of people where you can find that audience who would like sit there and be like on edge like being oh my gosh that just happened to me i think doing micro things that don't your podcast in a way is like the punk rock reflection of who you are when you're 17 because you wouldn't start this podcast to like quote unquote get rich you would start it to like hang out with your friends and like reminisce about like the awesome period where you like came of age you know what i mean oh and dude yeah reversal i mean everyone that i talk to i mean i i kind of i've been this has been on pause since March just because I did you know, I've done like 212 interviews and a, a lot of them were people that like sometimes people will recommend someone I'm like, okay. And then I talk, I was like, wow, this interview was awesome. But then there's some other people where I got to talk to the drummer from Sunny Day Real Estate. I had this question and I've said this a lot of times, but I had this one question. I'm like, Hey man, there's this sound clip in, um, tearing in my heart. I'm like, what is that? He goes, Oh, that's my sister. And then my brain goes, I remember back in 1998 reading an article where his sister died and he wanted to hit the drum so hard it cracked the earth to bring her back. So I'm just like, holy shit man so then i asked him that and he's like yeah i remember that interview i'm like whoa this is crazy so it's like those little tiny micro things like you're saying that have happened in all of these interviews where i've just been starstruck like talking to people or you know with this interview i think some people would be like you know what's the like maybe there were skateboards back in the day but i'm like this one's purely for me <laughs> like oh yeah that's you earned that man we did 98 episodes of our podcast so, so much work for anyone listening who doesn't know like what you have to go through oh my god the tech, the tech every time you do an interview the thing about it is like you know instead of trying to find massive audience like tell your version of your story that and like, I like the idea that you connect with me and it's not like you're just interviewing because like no one at the end of the day really probably cares like who I am or whatever. But like the people who do really care, which is much better than like, oh, yeah, you're famous on Instagram, but nobody really knows anything about you because those like I, I just hung out with this dude who was like at a party and he was like 
telling me everything about like that movie. And I was just like, why don't you come to my house in a few weeks? And like, I remember meeting him before, but he was like, oh, you don't remember me. And I'm like, I do. And then like, he was at my house, like at a barbecue, like four weeks later. And we were just like geeking out. Um, And like, he gave me a gift by recollecting that those moments. Cause I'd forgotten a lot of them. It's a, like, a you know, the scene creates kind of this brotherhood. And I don't mean that in the, like the like male dominated sense. I mean that in like the like community sense. So like what you're doing, I think is amazing. And then also like I was saying like the full circle thing, like in that video, if you remember, I had no effects as my song. All of a sudden I get a call 2006, I want to say, and they're like, hey, you want to make a music video for no effects? And I remember I like couldn't because I was doing this thing for Epitaph at the time and it was like there's something wrong and they were like pissed but i called my like boss on the job and i was like hey i know this is already like late but i just got called and asked to do a no effects music video and it was like he was like oh yeah just go do that and then finish it like he didn't have to even hear the story like how much it meant to me financially or because there was just that shorthand of like okay no effects doesn't make music videos which if you go back and look it's really weird i think they made like one music video or two maybe now i think there's like four total but which one did you not which, that many which one did you do so we did seeing double at the triple rock where like yeah just that that dude fat mike so amazing what he did for punk and like no nobody who ever is in his position doesn't get the kind of flack from the scene but he just didn't care and he just kept making like those metal punk bands like famous <laughs> yeah just like that was like what i like so i put the no effects song in my section or dan or someone did and then like to be making that video was like just bucket list yeah and like that guy was so cool like he didn't we kind of were like always used to record labels like not having money or like not paying us like they would always try to like you know, it was just like scummy music stuff sometimes. Like not not every time, but more than when you work with like a Fortune 100 company that has accountant, right? <laughs> like <laughs> you, you know, you're on your like ninth month begging for the money. Uh-huh. You start to get a little gun shy to do the music videos. So, but that dude, I remember was like, how much does this cost? Well, he added money to that budget. Everyone was getting hungry at the Triple Rock. He just like bought everyone food. And like, it was... I don't know, probably 300 people dressed up as nuns or priests at the Triple Rock, which is owned by like the Dillinger Four dudes. Like it's, those guys are cool too. And like, he didn't like, he just took care of people. Right. And then that video turned out awesome. And it was just like, so cool to be like in that scene. And like, you know, you're just hanging out with like Patty Costello from D4 and he's like in the video. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah. And like, I don't know, like I wasn't a huge punk fan by that time. But I just feel really lucky that I got to like, you know, like the Foo Fighters thing I was telling you about or whatever. Yeah, what um, Foo Fighters video was this again? Okay, so so um, it was called Back and Forth. Oh, yeah, when they're in the big, like, open room. Din, 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 like, yeah, so so this was, uh, how do I explain this? That that video is um, a different video, but it's for the record Back and Forth. And then, like, they're fighting, like, police or something. That's the one that everyone remembers. But what we did is we, Justin Staggs, like, won a contest. Oh, I'm watching. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's like basically a post-apocalyptic future where Foo Fighters are still playing, but they're all old men. Right. But they did a video for every record or every song in that record, which was kind of cool. And yeah, we were one of the official videos. I don't know. It was just amazing like to to have that happen and to like be a fan of the band and then end up kind of making something for them. You know, it's kind of crazy about that and almost sad at the same time. These so it's the, all the band members dressed up as old men, right? Yeah. Just like the fact that Taylor Hawkins, it's like him in the future. Yeah. Like that's got to be pretty gnarly if like Dave Grohl sees this. Yeah, it's super sad. And like my one of my like kind of you know mentors and friends uh, had done some Foo Fighters videos. Um, his name is Rick Fuller, um, and he was a producer. But like Phil Harder, the director of those original Foo Fighters videos in like the late '90s and early 2000s, like they were like friends with those dudes. And and I hung out with them a few times, but I I. I wouldn't say like they even knew who I was, but like, yeah, you just think about how hard that must have been for them. So many of those dudes who came kind of became big in the early 2000s, they were fans of the punk scene. And that's how they started making that that sound of music. And then that kind of morphed. But like those people were like friends, just like your scene and had a couple of big time people emerge out of it that then were influential on like the next 10 years sound and so people think of them as like oh they're so famous i can like be mean to them or something but they're just like people you know what i mean and like i can't imagine what 
all those filmmakers and you know musicians went through when they were truly friends with someone from making like so many projects with them or make or touring you know think of how close you got on those tours with people you know oh, horrible for them yeah to this day i mean i still there's people we slept on their floors and i still talk to them you know like randomly um so before i ask the last two questions i think you i don't know maybe there's something there i, had, I started asking this like a year or so ago is there a story that you've always wanted to tell in an interview that you've never told that you can tell right now Man, there's probably so many that would people would love to hear about, like famous people or something. But I feel like, again, I don't want to always tell those. But that's such a good question because I don't know, like the ones that I think might be universally interesting to like music people was was I've I've never told us on a podcast, but I remember like while talking about the Gwen Stefani thing, um, I was supposed to interview Sublime. I was on Warp Tour, but they got kicked off Warp Tour, and I was going to meet him in Chicago. And, you know, you talk about, like, bands that you were huge fans of, like Green Day or Sublime or whatever. And I used to, like, call the magazines and be like, hey, I'm, I'm going to get an interview with you of whoever. And then they would love it because they got free content. I made a very little bit amount of money, and they, you know, put out a magazine. So I have a story where I met Cool Keith. Do you know who that is? No. So Cool Keith is this famous rapper who was, um, you know, Dr. Octagon. You remember that record? Yeah. From, uh, but he was famous in New York, like way before that. I basically start listening to the opening band's music and I like, you know, I know like who he is and everything. And I'm going to I'm going to interview him. And I got like a credential and everything that go. And they were like, hey, while you're there, interview the I think his name was DJ Spooky. So I had no idea who that was. And, they like sent out, I, I, you know, you've been on tour. Like there's like a whole group of people that need to like do stuff. So the band looks effortless. So I don't know if he was the promoter or the tour manager or the tech, but they sent him out to do the interview as DJ spooky. <laughs> and so I inter do this interview with this guy and he's giving me the craziest answers, but they didn't know that. Then I had, a I said, had set up to interview cool Keith afterwards. So then he came on the tour bus and I realized that the guy that I just interviewed wasn't actually DJ spooky. <laughs> it was like <laughs> some other guy. So anyway, I did the interview with cool Keith and he was, he was crazy, you know, like, like super genius. He made, he's had made like, I don't know, 50 records or something and like under 26 different pseudonyms. So even if you're not into like rap and you're a punk rapper, just look up this dude. Cause he's, he's amazing. But I was kind of embarrassed and like, he, was like really bummed I didn't smoke weed, but like he hung out with me <laughs> after the interview was over for a while. And I didn't think anything of it. Like I just went kind of away and thought that was a cool story. It was for Box Magazine. So if you can find the internet, I don't know if it's out there somewhere, but maybe I'll post a link to some of this stuff. I was trying to like, I was on Warp Tour and he ended up on Warp Tour. And I don't know, this had to be four years later, five years later. And I like ran into him and he remembered me. <laughs> just just weird. And he was like, telling me stuff about that night and he was like oh do you want to go hang out so i like went i remember i was with my friends and i had to leave them because i was like i'm gonna go hang out with cool keith and they were like that's really weird but okay <laughs> and then he like introduced me to all these like punk bands that i was like fans of where i was like probably a little bit older at this time but totally like that same feeling of like waiting to interview brad noel and then he just doesn't show up and just being like no and now like i got it was like one of the first times i got taken backstage with like a full credential where like Sometimes the press doesn't have access to where like the artists are. And this guy was just like walking me around. And then like he kept asking for like, he's like, where the book house at? And I, I didn't know what he meant, but it's like, he's like saying he was stuck in the middle of Wisconsin and he couldn't get porno. <laughs> and so he was like, hey, will you drive to this place I found? This was also before you could look anything up on your phone, remember? Found like a really sketchy porno shop in the middle of Wisconsin nowhere. And I was like, I can't do that. I got other stuff I got to do. And I just remember this feeling of just letting him down. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, if I were to say a theme for this interview, it is sort of that almost famous thing. And I, and I feel really grateful that I got that a little bit to just, cause I wasn't a musician, you know? Yeah. I work for like, you know, the X games and like the world series of poker and like some of these shows that where I got to like, you know, be an athlete and then end up being in the truck editing the films that, that, or editing the video that you see on TV. And so I don't know, I just feel like that progression is um, rare. And so I'm really grateful that I got to like do all that from both sides, being the angry punker kid complaining about the contest and how it could be better to like seeing what they go through to get that show on the air. It's just kind of like it's humbling a little, you know what I mean? Where you realize, wow, I was kind of a jerk in 1994. Yeah. When I didn't understand how things worked, you're like, yeah, that makes sense. 
But yeah, I don't know. Hopefully this was, I try to tie in enough stuff that it might be interesting for a non, uh, you know, rollerblader or something. But um, yeah, man, this is great. I, I've enjoyed this in all day. I mean, at the end of the day, like I, I know there's a lot of people out there, especially my friends from like all my buddies from high school were still close. So I've been sending them links to shit. And like, I never tell them who I'm interviewing, but I just send them like the, I send them the harvesting the crust. My buddy Rob, who has to keep bringing it up all the time. I sent him a link to that the other day, and then my buddy Bob and Rob, I just sent them the hoax to reun- reunion. They're like, "Holy shit!" So they're gonna be, they're gonna love this one. What's your recollection of that era? Like the, f- like when you saw those videos with those buddies, do you remember like the, the music and the like? What are your recollections of seeing that? Because I, because I've heard this from a lot of people, so I'm, I'm actually fascinated to hear your, your version of that. So we started. I was like a junior in high school. No, I'm sorry. I was a freshman in high school and my buddy Chris, who we started a band together and he he was the one who would go out and buy certain punk bands. My buddy Bob, he had like, remember he had Face to Face, the one with the, the bulldozer or whatever on the cover of it. And then then all of us would get together. My buddy Rob, he, so we were all like, like in school, then we just kind of all came together and we'd listen to this. So we'd drive around. This is where we started smoking cigarettes, started smoking pot just listening to all this stuff and then we then my buddy rob started my buddy bob and rob started doing skate rollerblading i was like oh that seems like an easier entry into this than doing skateboarding and for me like i played bass in a punk band so bass is like the rollerblading entry of like going and playing instead of a guitar and but yeah it was like we were doing that we'd be on a saturday in a driveway with a a built ramp that was way too big that we were jumping off of and landing on our asses and like breaking bones and then we'd be playing this mixtape in the background that my buddy Rob would make. And then he would show up with these tapes and then he'd be like, here's mad beef. So we'd sit and watch that. And then we're like, what the fuck? We should find rails. And this is like the same time we're driving. So then we're driving late night to go to schools when we were bored. My friend would call me at like 10, 10 PM and be like, yo, what are you doing? It's summer. I was like, nothing. He's like, you want to go skate? I was like, yes. So we'd go and we, then we'd watch like harvesting the crust. And actually funny story about this. Um, I don't want to talk too much about myself, but the first time I saw it, we were at, so my girlfriend, my first l- true love at the time, she lived in Ridgewood, New Jersey, and we were hanging out. He suddenly got a, started getting super sick and we were supposed to go skiing the next day. So he puts the video in and we're watching it and then he's like dying on the couch. So then me and her start playing bumper pool and we just start like making out. And I just remember this vividly. And, uh, and so I'm like not watching the skate video cause I'm like, making out with this girl who became like this you know my first love or like you know we was there for five years so that was actually the first wow i didn't even think of that. that was the first time we saw that and then later on but then we'd start watch i'd watch it multiple times and be like oh my god this is that fucking film that was in the background i'm making out with emily <laughs> this is great yeah we were responsible for your like 15 16 year old soundtrack pretty much uh, yeah the, yeah that's awesome well um i gotta run and pick my kid up because like you like i said now i have all these responsibilities but yeah i'm sure uh if you want to like think of anything else um i can't think of anything to edit out but I'm sure i'll think of it when i'm listening to it can i ask you a really quick question this way end yeah. it with all the time um all right so what's punk what scene ethics do you hold on to to this day um so i think like the idea that like I, nobody can really tell you anything the thing that you're giving you just heard advice on is like, what's going to like strip the amazing part out of your art. You know, like I always get people want me to like give them advice on their movie um, or whatever. And I, first thing I would say is like, don't listen to anyone, including me, like make your movie, do whatever you want to do. Because as soon as you start like trying to like, I don't know, do something according to some formula, you don't get like Butch Vig making those weird sounds or like Sonic youth or whatever. Right. You don't get the punk rock, progression that takes you know whatever pop punk from 1994 and turns it into like whatever fame famous or favorite band you hear in 2008 and that sound and then like whatever's going to be in 2040 or 30 like a lot of those punkers are now rap people in a weird way you know so to me like i kind of like how epitaph and some of these other people acknowledge the spirit not the sound um so yeah i still think of that to this day (laughs) 